All right, this is the second recording of the lecture in eukaryotic structures for motility, lecture number five. So what we have over here, it's an eukaryotic cell. And the eukaryotic cells, as you know, are characterized by having a nucleus, lipid membrane bound organelles, a defined cytoskeleton with cytoskeletal filaments made of actin or microtubules, as well as intermediate filaments. One thing that we know is that the cytoskeletal filaments are essential for eukaryotic microbe motility. Cytoskeletal filaments in eukaryote cells are composed of two major proteins, microtubules and actin. The microtubules are polymers of alpha and beta tubulin, forming a hollow tube that elongates from the microtubule organizing center. They are going to be the main components of the flagella and cilia in eukaryotes. On the other hand, actin form long thin filaments that traverse the entire cell under the cortex. They are polymers of the monomer actin and they are required for movement by cells that lack flagella or cilia, like amoeba cells. One thing that we can show you here as a review is that the macrotubules form um, tubes in which the alpha and beta tubulin molecules form profilaments. A traditional microtubule we have between 13 and 15 profilaments, looking over here in a sense in this transmitting electron microscope as an elongated tube rope. Now, polymerization of microtubules occurs in the plus end of the microtubule. Subunits of flagellin will come together forming olig oligomers, and those oligomers eventually will form a growing tubule. More alpha and beta actin will be added until the entire microtubule is constructed. Now, eukaryotes can either move by cilia or by flagella. Both these units are derived from microtubules. Cilia are about 0.25 micrometers in diameter, but they're not very long in compared to the cell. They are between 2 to 10 micrometers long. Remember, a traditional eukaryotic cell could be from 10 to 20 to 30 micrometers in length, so the cilia are relatively small. They occur, as you see here in the paramecium on the upper left, right, throughout the entire body of the organism, though some organisms will have them in specified locations. Each cilia is bound by an extension of the plasma membrane, making them internal organelles. What we're going to also see is that a very similar structure, the flagella, again, it has a diameter just like the cilia, about 0.25 micrometers. However, it differs in their length. The cilia can be between 2 to 10 micrometers and the flagella between 10 and 200 micro micrometers long, so a lot longer than the cilia. They're also a lot fewer. Some cells only have one cilia versus those cells um, may have up to eight. Cilia, like flagella, are also surrounded by a plasma membrane, making it as well an internal organelle. In this image, what you have is a picture of Chlamydomonas, which is a ciliated protist, an alga, so it has also um, chlorophylls and chloroplasts, excuse me, with chlorophyll. And this small alga are motile, they have a flagella. And what you can appreciate an expansion of the image here in the red square, it's that the formation of the flagellum happens internally and within the plasma membrane. So this line over here shows the plasma membrane, and as you can appreciate, it goes around the structure of the nascent flagellum. The flagellum also protrudes outside of the cell wall. So both cilia and flagella are internal organelles. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to illustrate some of the examples of organisms that swim via flagella or via cilia. The first movie is going to be of a paramecium. Notice how the cilia are beating as the little paramecium is moving along the axis. Here is another way, so look at how the paramecium is moving by beating of its cilia. 
in the next movie, I'm going to show you an example of paranema. And paranemas are free living flagellate proteins that have a single flagella. They are related to the proteins euglena. So here is a movie of the microorganism paranema. It has a single flagellum that is beating um, in order to, for it to move. It can move in the direction of the flagellum or use the flagellum to propel itself. This is a hunter microorganism um, and it doesn't have chloroplasts like the euglena, which is its most related causing. So now you have seen two examples of eukaryotic cells, one moving with cilia and one moving with a flagellum. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the structure of the cilia and the flagella. Both organelles have a common structure consisting of the axonym, which as we described earlier, it's 0.25 micrometers in diameter. The axonym is connected to a basal body, that is the beginning of the structure, and the basal body is present very close to the cytoplasm of the cell. The entire organelle is surrounded by an extension of the plasma membrane, so it's an internal organelle, which is different from the, from the prokaryotic flagellum. Between the axonym and the basal body, you have a small transition zone that has macrotubules as well, and it's a very different arrangement of the axonym. We're going to see that in a moment. The basal body, it's the beginning of the flagella or cilia. It is identical to a centriole, and it has nine sets of tubular microtubule structures called triplets. They're called triplets because they're composed of three independent macrotubules attached to one another. So an A, a B, and a C macrotubule. Now, having nine structures that go around the center, and none in the center, so this circular structure is not a microtubule, makes this a 9 plus 0 arrangement. As I mentioned earlier, those three tubules share a common wall. One complete tubule, which is the A, and two incomplete tubules, the B and the C. The cilium and flagella is forming from the basal body. So as this centriole moves and migrates to the cell surface, eventually it will make contact with the plasma membrane and it provides a site for macrotubule nucleation. So as the nucleation site, macrotubule assembly begins, initiation, initiating excuse me, the polymerization of the nine outer doublets of the axonym. And this part, which is the, at the very base of the macrotubule, is the basal body. The macrotubule itself is made of an axonym structure, and the axonym structure differs from the basal body, in which it has uh, doublets instead of triplets. So here you see the 9 plus 2 structures having two, uh, having two macrotubules, an A and a B, and you have now in the internal portion of the axonym two central macrotubule pairs. This image at the bottom of the figure, it's showing part of the three-dimensional reconstruction that you have with the macrotubule. And this is uh, data that I found in this paper from Ricastro Daniela uh, in PNAS in 2005. Now, what I'm going to show you now, it's a movie that is going to take cross sections of transmitting electron microscope and it has put them together to visualize how the axonym moves. So what they have done is that they put a white rod in the center of the axonym to give the uh, micro to give the structure a reference. And then they put color structures around some of the external doublets. So the slice has shown a progressive shape of the flagella and how it moves with time. The blue line, this we're going to follow, is going to be shown moving transversely in the diameter as the axonym contracts. So take a look at this for a second. So you see, you have a white tube that is going in one of the central spokes. I want, I want you to take a moment here. It's the movement of the blue and the yellow line, which are passing across some of the doublets. Now, 
Notice the undulatory way in which the structure will move during flagellar movement. Whereas the center stays the same, according to this model, the structures in yellow and in blue will move. Now, that was put together into a different model, and this is what the second part of this movie is going to show you. So this is going to show you the idea of how the entire macrotubule structure will move in the flagellum. Notice how the entire flagellum moved by an undulatory uh, fashion. So that is what is giving the idea of how the sperm or the tail on the flagellum of a protease moves in. So you can see in the last part of the movie of how that movement resembles the undulatory move of a starling sperm. And as you see here in the image, the sperm has this undulatory movement captured by the SEM image. The other picture that I'm going to show you here now, it's showing a three-dimensional reconstruction of the macrotubule. So here now we have the computer-generated cross-section of the axoneme in the flagella. I'm going to stop the image. So as you can see, we have the nine pairs of macrotubules surrounding the internal pair. What we're going to be looking soon are these white molecules that are bound to the A macrotubule, and those are going to be the dining motors. What you can also appreciate are the spokes which are connecting the external macrotubule pair to the central macrotubule pairs. Here are, again, the other way in which you can appreciate the dining heads and how they are bound to the A macrotubule. And as we're going to see later, they're going to use the B macrotubule of the adjacent macrotubule pair as a railroad track. Now, let's take a look at the next slide. So this slide, it's here to show you the basic structure of the macrotubule in the flagellum. As we talked earlier, it's going to be composed of a basal body. The basal body has the 9-0 assembly, so 9 macrotubule triplets forming a star at the bottom of the macrotubule, um, at the bottom of the flagellum. You have an intermediary stage, shown here in the middle, and there you have the axoneme portion. The axoneme, if we take a cross section and put it here on the sign, the cross section of the cilium, you have nine pairs of macrotubules, one that is perfectly round and another one sort of half moon. The half moon is the B macrotubule, the perfectly round one is the A macrotubule, so that is the outer doublet macrotubule pair. You have the two in the middle, those are the inner pair of macrotubules. This is why we call this a nine plus two arrangement. So the macrotubule doublets surrounding the central pair are connected by radial spokes, shown over here. And between the macrotubule pairs are the dining arms. As you know, the dinings are ATP-dependent motor proteins that are going to be able to move towards the negative pole of the macrotubule. Those radial spokes over here connect the outer doublets to the central pair. So let's take a better look at the macrotubule structure. So this complicated slide I am putting here to give you a better idea of the structure of the cilia. I'm leaving the text here for you to read. I'm not going to read this, but I'm just going to discuss a little bit about the figure. So as we discuss, shown here in number two, you have the basal body uh, of the cilia. That it's then followed by the complex axoneme, and as you can see, the entire structure is surrounded by a membrane. So the cilia or the flagellum are internal structures that are going to be surrounded by the membrane. That is required because, as we discussed in Bio 110, 
the dining enzymes that are the dining motors that are going to be mediating movement require ATP. So that's a big difference between the prokaryotic and the eukaryotic molecule. So I have a couple of slides for you with more text so you can get a better understanding of the structure. So that's number one, number two, and number three. I'll leave that for you to watch at your own time. So let's talk a little bit about the dining motors. As we discussed before, and you know, dining are small ATP uh, base motors that are going to move along the macrotubules towards the negative end. In the axoneme structure, shown over here in this part A of the figure, you have the doublets, and in, at each doublet you have a dining, a set of dining motors that are bound all along the A portion of the macrotubule, and they're going to be using the neighboring B macrotubule as a railroad track. So you can appreciate also this in this picture on the right hand side, where you can look over here and you have the dining heads attached to the A portion of the macrotubule, and they're using the B portion of the neighboring macrotubule as a railroad track. So each doublet comes accompanied by a set of dinings that use the neighboring macrotubule as a track. So there's multiple models that we understand now for the way in which the axoneme makes the macrotubule move. And some of this we learn in Bio 110. So just to recapitulate really quickly, um, part of the component of the axoneme are the linking proteins that are keeping the macrotubule doublets tethered together. If we digest those proteins out and we add ATP to a pair of macrotubules from the axoneme which are bound to one another, what we see is the movement of the, di of the doublet towards the negative end and the other one being used by the macrotubule is moving towards the positive side as it's being slided once against the other in opposite direction. But when we look and maintain the linking proteins together and we add ATP, what we end up having now is bending of the entire structure. So each microtubule doublet is going to force its neighbor to bend. Now, as you know, you have nine different microtubule doublets, each of them with dining motors attached to them. So when a dining microtubule is forcing the neighbor to move and making it bend, the same thing is happening by the bended doublet. That is forcing the neighboring doublet to bend as well. And that is what is going to be causing the undulating movement that the flagella and cilia has. So this was tested experimentally by different ways. One of them was, as we discussed, by the dilution of the linking proteins that keep the doublets together. So when ADP is added, one of them moves to the negative direction and the other one is moving to the positive direction. But if you put them to a solid support and you add ATP, that is going to make them to bend. And therefore, they're not moving, but the that is going to give you a bending mechanism. The bending mechanism will be shared between those two pairs of doublets, but since you have nine of them, each of them using a neighboring macrotubule, all of them are going to be going through subsequent bending and releasing cycles, which gives the beating motion of the uh, flagella or the cilia. So, Cilia and flagella, though so they're moving through the same kind of ATP-driven mechanism, they display relatively different kinds of beating patterns. The cilia move in an oar-like pattern of beating, which is composed of a power stroke followed by a recovery stroke, and that power stroke is what generates the force parallel to the surface of the cell. The cilia usually beat at a coordinated manner, so a group of cilia are going to move at unison, all having a power stroke and recovering also as well. So between a cycle of 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 seconds, you're going to have the movement of the power stroke followed by a recovery stroke. 
This is shown over here in this image. So you have over here in the sample shown in the media, in the picture, a cilia, which is nice and erect, and during the power stroke, that cilia is going to bend down. During the recovery stroke, that cilia is going to go and become erected one more time. So now in this movie that I'm going to show you now, we're going to be able to appreciate its pattern of movement. Notice how the cilia in this high magnification image are moving at unison. So you can basically follow the cilia in the middle. So if you look, for example, at this region right here, you can follow the, the cilia as they're coming down and falling down. Power stroke, recovery stroke. Power stroke, recovery stroke. You can also appreciate that some of the cilia, and not all the cilia, are moving simultaneously. They follow a wave-like pattern where, where some of the cilia are having the power stroke, neighboring cilia are now undergoing the recovery stroke. But this very mesmerizing way of the cilia moving is sufficient to cause a force over the surface of the cell that is going to make the cell move. Here in this other slide, we can look at a picture of the stensor. So stensor, it's a um, protozoan, it's about 500 to 1500 micrometers long, so it's very large, and it uses the cilia in this area to fed for food. What I want you to notice is the coordinated order of movement of the cilia. What some cilia are undergoing the power strokes, other ones are recuperating during the recuperation stroke. I'm going to show you another movie now of the same movement of cilia in the surface of a paramecium. So here in this movie you can appreciate uh, the paramecium's body. So the scientist is looking to try to put the cilia in the focal plane. And as you see, the cilia are pulsating with movement. Power stroke, recovery stroke. Power stroke, recovery stroke. As you can see, the scientist is having a difficulty making sure that they are in the focus plane of the cell surface where the cilia are, be, are moving. So it, the, the microscope is going in and out of the focal plane and every time they can, they're able to show you the cilia as the cilia are moving. So here they are again. This is the good kind of focal area and you can appreciate how the cilia are going down in the power stroke and coming up in the recovery stroke. Look at them at the very end. Here is a good way. You can see the beautiful pattern of movement, power stroke recovery, power stroke recovery. So this is happening around the entire surface of the paramecium. So the kind of movement that the cilia are generated is exerting the force over the cell. Flagella, however, move in a little different way. The movement that the, flagella, that the flagella propagate is happening along the cell and not parallel to a cell. So it's usually symmetrical and it's undulatory in nature. Some people even show that it has a helical pattern. Whereas the bacteria flagella move like a, ro like a rotor, the flagella in eukaryotes it's moving left and right left and right with also a twist so it's giving force parallel to the flagellum now the cell is going to move in the same direction as the axis of the flagellum so it's not following sides like the cilia can allow you to do and the locomotory pattern in most of the flagellated cells that we're going to look provides propulsion to the cell with the flagella trailing behind. But as we saw already with that uh, perineum, you can actually have cells that follow the flagella instead of being propelled by the flagella. They're following the flagella as they're moving forward. So what we're going to show you now are multiple different ways in which the flagella move. In this picture here, we have euglena. Euglena is a unicellular alga that uses the flagella to move. And as it's shown over here, 
the flagella is moving in an undulatory fashion and the euglena is following the movement of the flagella. Now, that is euglena with a single flagellum. But let's look at Chlamydomonas, which has two different flagella. And we're going to see in this movie is that Chlamydomonas have two different kinds of strokes according to the way in which he wants to move. And we have movie, movie with it, I mean music with this movie. So what we're going to do is to hold the Chlamydomonas by a pipette. And you're going to see now them changing in the synchronous versus asynchronous. So on the left you have the synchronous movement. And on the right you have the asynchronous movement. Notice the difference. So what you're going to see is a changing of synchronous, which allows the organism to move in one direction, with the asynchronous movement that is going to make a turn. So because of the use of these two types of movement, Glamidomonas can swarm and move really effectively across the water column in the search for light. So the next movie that I want to show you is going to illustrate how the sperm of mice swim. So what this movie is showing is the flagellar movement of the mouse sperm, and as you can appreciate from it, the cells are moving in an undulatory fashion. Similarly, this other movie is going to follow and trace how the sea urchin sperm moves, but it's going to have a different movement. What you're going to see is the movement of the head of the sperm compared to the movement of the tail of the sperm. Appreciate the way in which the sperm is moving. And now in the second part of the movie, we're going to have trace analysis to show the different movement of the head compared to the movement of the tail. So the blue line, it's showing the undulatory way in which the head of the sperm is moving, whereas the tail also is moving in an undulatory phase. It's just a different wavelength of undulation. In both these movies that I just showed you about sperm motility, the sperm have to be placed in a viscous solution to slow down their movement. So to summarize, both the flagella and cilia are using sliding macrotubules in the axoneme for motility. The flagella is going to move in an undulating whip-like fashion, propelling the microorganism forward, whereas the cilia moves by a power stroke and a recovery stroke kind of movement. Whereas you often have one to two flagella in a microorganism, you now have thousands of cilia that are covering the entire organism, and they work in a coordinated fashion to allow that microorganism to move. So one of the things that I would like you to keep in mind is the difference in which the propeller base movement of the prokaryote flagellum is to the eukaryotic flagella and cilia. Now let's take a look at a different kind of eukaryotic movement, and that's going to be the actin phase movement. This is something that we cover a little bit in Bio 110, but we're going to look a little bit more detail here. As you know, the actin cytoskeleton serves many functions for the cell. Some of them are going to be part of the actin uh, cytoskeleton is going to form the cortex. Other ones are going to form the lamellopodium that is allowing for the extension of the membrane forward of the cell. And some are going to be part of the philopodia that are going to be in the leading edge of the cell as it's moving. And this is what you can appreciate here in part C of the figure as the membrane is pushing up. As you learn in Bio 110, the polymerization of acting filaments underneath the plasma membrane helps to push the membrane forward during movement. And as we discussed before in Bio 110, you have proteins like the ARP complex that are going to allow for the branching of the acting filaments. Now, when a cell is moving by acting polymerization, we're going to see that this space on substrate 
binding, very similar to the gliding mechanism in prokaryotes that do not use a flagellum. Therefore, they have to be attaching to a substrate. Here in the cell, you have the acting cortex underneath the cell membrane, and in red, you can appreciate the areas where the cell is having contact with the substratum. The lamellopodia is the leading edge of the cell. It's moving forward. As the cell begins to elongate its acting, by well, elongate the membrane by polymerizing acting underneath that, that is going to push the membrane forward, and that is shown here in the area of red, which has active actin polymerization. And that is going to stretch the cortex underneath the cell, pushing it forward to the area of polymerization. At the same time, at the rear of the cell, you have myosin proteins which are going to work to contract the tail end of the cell, whereas in the front part of the cell, the membrane is now making new focal contacts with the substratum, and those focal contacts are mediated by integrins which are allowing it to bind directly to the substratum. And that results in the extension of the membrane forward. That can be seen over here in this movie that I'm going to show you just now. What I want you to see, and this is very recent, this just came out in the journal Cell Biology, are the areas of actin polymerization. So here in this movie, we're following a cell where we can visualize actin being polymerized by macroscopy, and those areas are going to be shown with this heat map as red areas. Notice as the cell is throwing the membrane forward that you have the polymerization of actin shown in red. Notice how the lamellopodia became very red as the cell is extending in that direction. So actin polymerization is needed for the extension of the cell plasma membrane. Here is another cell that is also undergoing polymerization of actin as seen in red. Here in these very quick pictures that are passing by, let me stop this for a second, you can appreciate the, uh, the membrane being extended here in the um, picture on the right which is not fluorescent picture, versus the picture on the left, now showing the polymerization of the acting or the the lamellopodia. Notice how quickly this happens when the, the movie is elongated. Anyway, um, I have the link for the movie so you can see them at your own leisure, but for the time of the... Uh, lecture, I am going to stop this movie now to go to the next topic of it. So again, polymerization of acting in the lamellopodia that are extending forward, it's required to push the membrane in the forward direction. Now, let's look at how an amoeba moves using the same kind of uh, actin polymerization movement. Let's look at another movie showing how an amoeba moves. So what I want you to take a look, it's how the leading extensions, the lamellopodia of the amoeba, are being pushed forward. And as we discussed, those are based on actin polymerization underneath the membrane. And as the previous movie also talked about, notice how the organelles inside the amoeba are also moving in the same direction. Last but not least, I want to show you how, um, in this very short picture, how the polymerization of acting is happening. This is a fish fibroblast, but again, the same thing is happening in a unicellular microorganism. What we have here are two proteins, actin marked by a fluorescent protein called M-cherry, and VSP, 
which is GFP label. The VFP is a protein that is conserved and it's an active regulatory protein. It is implicated in active movement, for example, in favor of migration. They are associated with the active uh, filaments and they prevent the formation of the capping protein. So notice the extension of green and extension of red. Acting is red, green is the vast protein. Let's look at that one more time, because it went really fast. So notice the extension of green and red. So the active polymerization happening in real cells. Let's take another example. Now let's look at a parasitic microorganism, Toxoplasma gondii, and how it, it shows gliding motility. Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan parasite. It's an obligatory intracellular parasite, and it causes the disease Toxoplasmosis. As you can see in this neonate, Toxoplasmosis generates uh, encephalitis. It can form lesions in the brain, shown over here in this left um, image, and it can also affect eyes and vision, shown here by this plaque. It is passed to host by two different ways. One is undercooked meat, and second by cacti feces. And it's an organism that moves without flagellum, and it's moving by gliding motility. Now, the life cycle of Tostoplasma is quite simple. The cat is the primary host of Tostoplasma parasites. And through cat feces, it can pass the... Um, parasite to people or to other animals, in particular for animals that are used in food. Now, when they infect the tissue of the animal, like the pig or the sheep, for example, and people consume the infected meat, they can also get toxoplasmosis. So humans and these other animals other than the cats are secondary hosts. So either through cat feces or through consumption of uncooked meats can now a person get toxoplasma. A third mechanism of infection is the mother to fetus transfer, which can lead to fetal to the fetus dying. Now, this is one of the main reasons why pregnant women are counseled against ki ki uh, cleaning the kitty litter if they have cats, because of the potential of having toxoplasma infection. Now, Tosmoplasma is an apicomplexan, meaning that it's a cell that has a conoid at the end. Now, it contains multiple membranes. It contains, as you know, a plasma membrane, but inside the cell there is an inner membrane complex, shown here by this blue line. It also contains uh, other organelles that make an apicomplexan. Some of them are going to be the conoids, other ones are going to be the rub trees, and the last ones shown here in pink are going to be the dense granules. The last part that I want to bring your attention are the micronemes, the small organelles that are placed in the conical area of the parasite. So now, rub trees, the dense granules and the macronemes are all secretory organelles and they're going to be essential for infection. Now, the macronemes are going to secrete um, adhesins that are going to be required for attachment to the host cell. So, apicoplescent parasites are a family of parasites that include also the parasite from malaria, Plasmodium falciparum. They both have a conoid. Here are shown the macronemes in blue. The rub trees are shown at this bat-like structures that are uh, cream in color. And the dense granules in both parasites are shown here in purple. Being a eukaryote, it's going to have a nucleus and mitochondria, etc., etc. So what we're going to show you now are two different movings showing Toxoplasma gondii's gliding motility. The first movie here from this paper is a time-lapse video showing the parasite engaging in a circular movement. As you can see now, as the parasite is gliding, it's moving around in a circular fashion. 
So it's movement without cilia or without flagella. It is based on gliding motility. The next movie over here, it's showing the parasite now engaging in what is called helical gliding. So the parasite is going to be turning a little bit around and flips on itself. Again, it's part of the gliding motility of the parasite. Again, both these are examples of moving without cilia or flagella. Now, gliding is essential for invasion of the parasite. And here is where those internal organelles that I mentioned to you earlier are going to be of importance. Now, two things I'm going to show you right here. This is from a nature review. Initially, as the parasite encounters a potential host cell, shown here in green, what is going to happen is the micronemes are going to come and move into the area of the membrane where the parasite is encountering the host cell. They are going to fuse there and they're going to now form what is called a moving junction. The moving junction prevents any host protein from moving in that junction with the protozoan. But as they're doing that, the protozoan is now being surrounded by a group of host membranes. As the protozoan moves inside, it's going to be now completely surrounded by the host plasma membrane. Let me show you this over here in, a, in the movie. And what you're going to appreciate is the change in the color of the parasite as invading the cell because it's now gaining a double membrane, one from its own and the membrane gained from the host. So here's the parasite leaving a cell. It is moving by gliding and now it is encountering a potential host cell and as it is encountering the host cell it's going to insert itself inside the cell notice how it's changing in color it's becoming darker and now in a matter of seconds it has now completely penetrated the host cell a little bit more about the life cycle and invasion of the parasite can be found in this movie. For the sake of time, I am not going to show you this movie about Tosmoplasma life cycle, but I will encourage you strongly to watch it on your own so you can get an idea of how the parasite invades its host. Part of the parasite-mediated invasion is the fusion of the micronemes, shown over here in this cartoon, as lilac looking structures. You are going to have the MYC2 protein which is going to require adhesion and those protein now are going to be part once the microneme fuses with the plasma membrane of the parasite is going to move those MYC2 proteins to the plasma membrane of the parasite. They are going to now form the membrane spanning domain and that locking place in which the parasite and the membrane of the host are together. The motility of the host of the parasite, excuse me, inside the host is going to be mediated by the trapped proteins. So in a similar way as we have the gliding motility mediated uh, gliding in bacteria mediated by proteins binding, here what we have are two membranes. The membrane at the bottom is the membrane of the host the target, here are a target receptor protein, and here now we have the MYC2T proteins binding to it. Interestingly enough, here, what you're going to look, it's the internal membrane of the parasite, that is to go, the inner membrane complex. And to that inner membrane complex, you're going to have myosin A proteins, which are bound and not moving. Those um, proteins are going to bind to actin filaments which are being formed by treadmilling. So adding, um, adding monomers at the plus end and being removed in the minus end. Here you also have cofiling and profiling molecules which are helping with the polymerization and the depolymerization of the actin filament. Now, the trap adhesion proteins, the M, the MYC, 2T are going to bind to the acting by this aldolase tetramer domain, which is going to make it fix. So, here is the interesting part. When 
the myosin A protein, it's, which is bound to a membrane, moves the actin filament. The actin filament, since the myosin A protein is bound to the membrane, it's stationary, and therefore now it's going to move the actin filament towards the plus N, which is going to result in the MIG 2T proteins being moved also in the same direction. So the direction of force, as shown here, is going to be to the right. But because the MIG A protein are moving the actin filaments into the left bound direction, the entire movement direction of the AP complexum will be to the left. So this is a very similar procedure as the treadmilling that we, or the racketing, excuse me, that we saw with Mixococcus earlier in the previous course. Now, here is a description uh, to follow that same uh, image that I show you, so I'm going to leave that here for your reading on your own. How do we know that the mycopes, the toxoplasma, are gliding? Because it leaves behind gliding trails, small areas of membrane which are being shed and they stick to the surface as the microorganism is moving forward through gliding. And that's an indication that those compasses are binding tightly to the surface in which the microorganism is moving. So, to finish, I'm going to leave you some movies that I would like you to see. Again, these are supplemental movies that are going to show you different ways in which cilia and flagella move, or how cilia are in motion, or cilia and protozoa. And for your own fun, here is a rendition of Teen Fortress 2, where Scout and Heavy are going to be giving their voice talents to show how a bacteria and neutrophil chase one another. And with that, I'm going to finish the lecture.